is church. But when it's all said and done, were you able to get what you came here for? You see, because church has been to the point where it is somehow witchcraft has crept into the church, as you're going to find out as I begin to speak on today's topic, that witchcraft has found its way into today's church to the point that people have been deceived so much that they accept witchcraft doctrines as being God's doctrine because a lot of people don't go home and study. You see, it's important that we study now more now than ever because there's so much stuff going on in the pulpit and somehow, some way, and I don't know when it started, but somehow they evicted the pastors and the preachers out of the church and somehow put motivational speakers and inspirational speakers in the church. And in the process of motivating you and inspirating you, there is no God. Yeah, they say God. They even may say Jesus, but are they really speaking to God and Jesus? Or are they speaking that what Jesus said, that they will come and speak other gods and other Jesus? So the question is, when they come up here... What are they really saying? I mean, how did we get these motivational speakers to come in, to pack churches, but when the man of God comes to speak, it's hard to get someone in the church? You see, we found ourselves connected to our emotions, so our emotions have us saying, wow, that felt good, I felt this, the anointing, this, the anointing, and to the point that people really don't know what the anointing really is or what it feels like. Because we're moved by emotion. The little bit of sound will draw us, our attention away and we find ourselves gravitating towards where the nearest noise comes from. Someone comes through the door and next you know we find ourselves gravitating to finding out who's in the door. Our attention is so much on different areas to the point the question is, where am I? Am I in church or am I at a motivational seminar? Let's go over here, Hosea 4 and 6 it says. Someone want to read that for me, Hosea 4 and 6. Now, here in this particular text, before we start reading, it speaks about how the preachers have deceived the people so much to the point that the preachers got mocked on point to the point it was more about titles than about saving souls. It was more about uh, uh, being the big man on campus and eating in the biggest, finest places and sitting in the front of the church and having all these accolades. It was more about that than the souls and winning, winning souls and going and visiting the sick and, and, and doing what the Bible says that preachers and priests were supposed to do it. More about that, they weren't doing that. It got to the point where they couldn't tell the difference between the priests and the people. So the priests started teaching things and started doing things that didn't line up with the word of God. So then Hosea says, God says, in Hosea he says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge I will also reject thee, that they, that thou also be no more priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law, thy God, I will forget thy children. So it's like, now that the preachers have gotten into the church and they have messed up the church, the preacher messed around and cursed our children. But we come to church and some of us don't study, so we allow someone to curse our children. And we wonder, we go out in the street, we wonder, why is so much death? Why is so much chaos? Because someone cursed our children. That's why Paul spoke so much about studying. It's not so much studying to gain knowledge, it's studying to give your spiritual man. See, studying is the thing that causes our spirit man to grow. It's like exercise. And the more we begin to exercise our spirit man, the more we are alert, the more our spirit man begins to fight the demonic realm. You see, we find ourselves getting sick. We find ourselves going through these things and wondering why all hell is breaking loose in our life because our spiritual man is dead. And if our spiritual man is dead, our whole house is in chaos. We say, I preached, I, I, I prayed the word, I, I, I said, I quote scriptures, I did everything that pastor said do, but why is all hell breaking loose in my life? Because I haven't been studying to show how I can be able to divide the word, to apply the word as medicine. You see, as we begin to get the word, we begin to digest the word, but we don't digest the word as we do it in the natural. We digest the word differently in the spiritual realm. See, because... 
People go through all hell and say, we have control and authority over everything that happens in our house and in our lives, but we fail to realize that we have that authority because we don't stop. You see, people quote that scripture, and they quote that scripture as if, and, but they don't quote that scripture. And that scripture should be quoted to the point where that scripture causes conviction and compassion and sorrow. My people perish for lack of knowledge. See, because it's not just my people that's perish. It's everybody in my house. Everybody in my community. It's everybody around me are dying because I won't study. And when I say I, I mean I as a preacher, I as a man, I as whatever you want to call it. It's not studying. See, because what studying causes us to do, it causes us to get so in tune with God to the point we can speak to the issues, and the issues have to line up to what we're saying to the issue. Yeah, that's right. Did anyone ever ask the question or wonder why if, uh, if God is the same yesterday, the day before, and never changed? Why can't we lay hands on the sick, raise the dead, and cleanse the leopard as they did in the past? And we go to the church, we go to the hospital, and we pray, and we pray, God, please save uh, my grandmother. God, God, please save my mother. Please. You're in there, you're pleading, you're pleading with all your heart and tears, asking God to save this loved one from death. And you're wondering why. It seems as if you're praying, and it's nothing happening. See, because we weren't told how to attach ourselves from our emotions. See, because we're finding ourselves praying emotional prayers to the point that if we knew how to study, we'll know how to go into the presence of God to the point that as we go into the presence of God, we don't even have to touch that person. Just being in the presence of God will cause that person to get healed. See, because our studying is the thing that causes us to get in contact. See, because with our studying, our studying shows us how to go to the throne. You see, there's more to just praying than praying. You gotta go to the throne. There's more to praying than praying, you gotta go to the Father. There's more to praying than praying because you've got to go before God. You have to go before the throne. You have to go before the, the you go before the heaven, the holy. Then the holy is the holy. There is a process that you take to go through these things so that you can be able to reach God and get the, and get God to move on your behalf. Get God to move in your circumstance. Get him to move in your situation. But if I don't study, I constantly get caught up. And do it the way that everyone else do it. Many of us got saved. And when we got saved, we brought the same prayer life over to our new life. Many of us probably was Catholic. Many of us were Jehovah Witness. Many of us Baptists. Many of us was Episcopalians, Protestants, Catholics. Whatever it was, you were an ex-something. Maybe you wasn't even in church, but still you had a little so-called hit and run prayer life. And then when you gave your life to God, you surrendered to God, you started going to church, you still had that hit and run prayer life going with God. And you're wondering, say, God, why isn't anything happening? I go to church, I tithe, I do all that you told me to do, but I'm wondering, why is nothing happening? Because you don't know how to enter into his presence. He said, I got, we have to get into his presence. Let's go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 33 and 6. Ezekiel 33 and 6. Someone get there before me, uh, read that for me. Amen? We have to know how to enter into God's presence. We have to take our Father serious. You see, Jesus said, the disciples actually said, teach us how to pray. He said, our Father. He didn't say, our God. He didn't say, uh, the man upstairs. He didn't say, hey, you. He didn't say nothing but our Father. So if I can understand him as being my father, then i got to address him as my father. The biggest misconception anyone ever taught was saying that you just go to God and talk to him like you talk to your friend. I don't know about you, but I can't talk to my father, my earthly father, the way I talk to my friends. Never could and never can. But yet we tell these lies, we spew these lies, and what happened? We get caught up in these lies, and then we find ourselves thinking we're praying to God, and we're not going to be really praying to the devil. See, because we get caught up in it saying that in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We don't have to say Jesus' name a hundred times in our prayer. Just in the beginning and wherever have God lead us. See, because when you go into prayer, you have to take your time and allow God to use you in your prayer. See, because uh, Ezekiel 33 and 6. So as you begin to pray, you don't pray fast. You take your time because when you're in your prayer, there's no time when God might just say, let me give you direction. But we were never taught to listen to God's voice in our prayer. We are never taught to listen to God when we study. We never taught how to listen to God. We just heard, well, it, you know, if God's will. Well, 
if I study the word of God, if I get into the presence of God, then I will begin to understand the will of God because I will walk in the will of God be, and I will be transformed into the will of God to the point that everything that I, is orchestrated in my life will be God's will. But we quote, if it's God's will, as if it's some big scriptorial thing and it's some cliché thing to the point that we find ourselves deceiving ourselves to the point we find ourselves binding our own self. But so if you bind on earth, should be bound in heaven. But we've been binding ourselves and losing demonic things on our lives, and we wonder why our finances are the way are. We're not called to give everybody the access for money, money. We're not, to, we're not called to pray for everyone that say, pray for me. Hmm. I guess I have somebody off guard with that one. We're not called to pray for everyone that say, pray for me, pray for me, because we don't know what it is that God is doing in their lives until we go before God's presence and say, God, is it, is it, do you want me to pray for this person? See, because when people, as we say in the Bible, because when people, well, how many of you ever heard this one before, okay? you in church or you're in a, in a situation and say, pray for me, right? And then the next question comes out, what do you need prayer for? Now we're playing counselor. Well, my husband is, my job is, and it's like the whole logistic line of the things that they're going through. So now it's prayer time. Father God, do you know their situation? I ask you, Lord, to touch their finances. I ask you to touch their household and touch this and touch that. But never have we ever said if they have an issue with their husband, we never said, well, God, I need you to deal with the person that I'm praying with so that you can do some things in their life. Because it might be something about them that's causing their husband to be the way he is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Amen. But yet we're praying out of emotion, not knowing that we're cursing the person we're praying for. That's why we're not allowed. We're not supposed to just go pray for anybody. We've got to go before God's presence before we start praying for anybody. Because also, transparent spirits would come on you, and you wind just find yourself getting attacked by whatever it is that they're going through. And you never know it because it happened some time later. And now, all of a sudden, you wonder why hell breaking loose in your house. Or now, all of a sudden, three, four, five people dying in a row in your life, and you think it's God's will. They're in a better place. No, they're not. Hmm. We just found ourselves just accepting death as God's will, and it's not. If we begin to understand the importance of praying, the importance of studying, we begin to know how to pray God's, God's uh, pray for God to move in a situation. If we look at Abraham, Abraham was able to change the mind of God. Abraham was able to shift the atmosphere instead of causing Lot to die when he killed, when he destroyed Sodom and Moore, he allowed uh, God to save Lot and his family, but only Lot and his wife came with it. Only Lot and his, his two daughters came because of his wife. She didn't want to get rid of the past. Did I lose anybody? Mm -hmm. Am I, everybody still with me? Mm -hmm. Amen. Nobody sleeping yet? <laughs> and I still haven't even got to my text yet. If I get to my text, I want to give you a title, just in case I don't get to my text, or even if I do get my, to my text, this is a prophetic sermon. My sermon is called Warning, Warning. So it be like shouting. Mm -hmm. Can you hear the alarm sounding? You see, because when God, God starts speaking to us, and he's constantly speaking to us, it's just a simple fact that really you can't hear him because you're ignoring him. But when God begins to speak to us, it began to show us the things that's going on around us, and we see all this chaotic stuff going on, and God is sounding the alarm because he's calling you out of where you're at so that you can be able to be a person that can be the one to save the souls of the people that's in your life, that you can stop your sons and daughters from going to the gates of hell, that you can stop the, 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 your, 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 your sisters and your brothers, your parents, and all the people around you. It is, your, it is you that he's calling to bring these people out of hell, but yet we ignore God by not studying, by not fasting, by not getting into his presence. We ignore God, and we ignore, and we miss rescuing our loved ones. We found out in Bible class that, and this, I want to say found out, but yet, you ever know something, but the second time around, the third time around, it, makes, it, it gets a little clear, God makes it a little clearer. We, was, we, were, we went to the scripture, God dropped the scripture in, 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 into our spirit. Because you know when you start studying, God began to bring other scriptures to you. Holy Spirit began to start dropping other scriptures to you. And start dropping, you start, You might start over in Hosea and then you know you wind up in Revelation or Genesis. And God takes you all around and you start, it's like playing on the search, on, on the, uh, on the Soul Train search board where you're trying to put the names together and, and put the pieces together. And we went to the scripture where it says that my people, no, was it? It was uh, rebellion. 
is unto witchcraft. And then it goes on and speaks how stubbornness is like praying to idols. And then as we began to meditate on that in the Bible class, we, I began to realize that witchcraft is in the church because there's so much rebellion in the church. From the, from the pulpit to the pew, there's so much rebellion. Every time we disobey God, every time we do things out of the will of God, we're in rebellion. So if we're in rebellion and we're praying in rebellion, who are we praying to? You ever get one of those prayers and it seems like you got some prayer and all of a sudden it seemed like it came to pass and it's like, wow, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. And all of a sudden when you got it, it was like all oh, hell broke loose the moment you got it. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard that, 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 that weird lie they tell you, you better be careful what you pray for because you might get it or, or uh, you never know who's asking your prayers? We have to get away from these cliches and these myths and these stuff that, that, that they indoctrinated into the church and people have brought their, their old, uh, the old back, you know, those, uh, what's it called? Uh, Paul calls it something else. Myth, myths and cliches. That, and, and all of a sudden we get so tied up into these lies to the point that we miss for lack of words, we miss God, and we lose out on what God has for us. But it says, rebellion is unto witchcraft. There's so much witchcraft in the church, it's just, it's just pathetic. You have everybody wants to be a prophet. Everyone wants to be an apostle, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Everyone wants to be everything, but no one wants to go out and witness. No one wants to go in and just go before God's throne and begin to, begin to pray for people. If I'm a prophet, then I shouldn't ask you what you need prayer for. We should just go into prayer. And then as we go into prayer, just say what God lead to say or what God said to say. See, because anything else is rebellion. Anything else is witchcraft. Anything else is psychic prayer. So I don't have to ask you what you need prayer for because I've been to the throne. If I've been to the throne, there's no need to ask you. Because as, I be, as we begin to pray, God will begin to say what he wants to say through us. Because if our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and then one scripture says the body is the temple of God, and the body, one scripture says, greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world, then if God resides in me, the Holy Spirit resides in me, then he already knows what you need of before you even ask of it. And if we're in prayer, then as we begin to go forward, then the word will come out that what you need. So I don't need for no one to tell me that, well, I need you to pray for my marriage. I need you to pray for this. Because then as God began to lead, God will begin to tell you, pray for this. Don't say anything about this. Pray for this. Don't say anything about that. Pray for that. Don't say nothing about that. See, because what happened is we find ourselves, as I said earlier, praying people the answer that they want to hear. Mm -hmm. And by praying the answer that they want to hear, they only, it only winds up having them more under demonic oppression. Ooh. It's almost like having a prophet prophesy to you, to your emotions about what God's going to do. And the process is, there is nothing that God is going to do in your life because God has already done everything in your life. As an intercessor, what happens is we begin to pray, and as we begin to pray and be in tune, because a good intercessor is always in the Word and always in God's presence, so then whatever it is that you're missing, that you find yourself cut off at, the innocent, we begin to touch, and we begin to touch, and God will begin to show you where you missed it at. How many of you ever took a trip and found yourself lost? And all of a sudden, you're like, wow, all I had to do was just keep straight? Because you felt you were lost for the simple fact that uh, you, you, you found yourself passing this place twice, not knowing that it was two different places. But, you know, when you start going out of town, a lot of places start looking alike, right? Yeah. You ask somebody for some records, especially when you go to a country town, you ask somebody, they tell you directions not by sign but by places. And so you begin to go, and you begin to go, then all of a sudden you find yourself lost. But then the intercessor is like that person that God uses to help you find your way. So where that, where that block is, then you say, okay, boom, you need to go on a fast. You need to do this. Because what happened is people get addicted to people prophesying to them. Mm -hmm. People get addicted to people praying for them. So the thing is with intercessors is to never have you get addicted to this. So what happened is the intercessor will show you how to connect to God so that you won't need that intercessor again. See, because when a person gets addicted to you, they stop praying on their own. All it takes them to get one little breakthrough and they're addicted to you. And now you're God, not knowing you're God, and they start giving you things and start, things start happening in your life. And you're wondering, why is this happening to me? And it happened to, and the simple fact is, as a good in, in a intercessor, no, I can't pray for you right now, uh, but you come back and to do this, or I'll pray for you on my own, uh, you know, but God will lead you how to say that, because 
we get so caught up in emotions and emotion tell us to pray for this person because they come to you and they sob and they, they might have was in a fight or in some type of situation our emotion got attacked it, 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 attached to this person, so now we're praying with this person out of, out, of a, out, of a, out of emotions, and God's saying, I didn't tell you to pray for that person. But as we begin to study and go before God, we know when to attach ourselves to people and when to detach ourselves from people. That's why people get hurt so much. They stay too long. You ever went to visit somebody and back in your mind say, it's time to go, it's time to go. Yeah, yeah. And you saw, and then all of a sudden, some part of your emotions say, no, no, because somebody, your favorite person came in the, in the house. I'm going to stay a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to sit back and we're going to kick it for a mile because I haven't seen her in a while. It wasn't for you to see that person. You were supposed to leave the moment that person got in. Now, all of a sudden, your feelings hurt. Fight broke out. Something broke out. And then, all of a sudden, you say, I know I should have listened to my first mind. What is your first mind? You should have listened to God when God said it was time to go. But yet, emotion told me I should stay. That's how people get hurt in churches when God says, okay, it's time for you to go, but yet they stay. Mm -hmm. Or God say, I need you to be the intercessor there, but yet you, people decide they just want to be a bench warmer. Or they decide they don't want to do a position, they just want to be there. I just want to be used by God, but you're doing nothing but sitting. Mm -hmm. And then we ask ourselves, and then we go through all chaos and chaos, and be wondering why God's not listening. And God's like, look, the moment you start listening to me, the moment I can start moving in your life. But my people. What he said, but, but what happened? Lack of knowledge. What does that mean? Poor teaching. That means false teachings, false doctrines. Somehow we got caught up into this, and God is sounding a horn. He's sounding an alarm. He's telling everyone to open up your ears and get into his presence. What's the importance of numbers if you can't have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with each member? If I sow into your ministry, and we have a hundred people in here, and I'm too busy to visit you, too busy to do anything for you, and you're sowing it to me, what's the purpose of you being there? What is the purpose? Because I, because what? A feel-good sermon? An inspirational sermon? Believe God for the best. <clears throat> It's hard to understand that one because as a believer, I'm constantly believing God for the best. I don't need anyone to preach me a sermon about inspiration and motivation. I need someone to preach me a sermon about salvation. How do I get into the kingdom of heaven? Not just me. How do I get my family in there? You know, I don't want to die or go to a funeral and Look at someone preach how they're in a better place and there's no more suffering, there's no more this and there's no more that. And we have no idea where that person wound up going. Because if they went to hell, then they're preaching a lie on the pulpit. But what happened to the preachers preaching about hell? What about the preachers preaching revelation? Preaching about salvation, preaching about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, preaching about the love and salvation, preaching about uh, how to restore homes and, and, and with the word. What happened? It came all more about money than salvation. What good is to gain the whole world and lose your soul in hell? You see, hell is real, no matter if you want to believe it or not. You see, the sad part about a lot of stuff, you can say, I don't believe it, but it exists. You say, I never believe I'll get this. I never believe I'll get that. But if you keep living a life that's, that's, that's leading that way, you're going to get it no matter how much you don't believe it. The more I get into ministry, the more I find myself unsubscribing to different doctrines and teachings. Because it blows my mind that I find myself repenting so much. That's not the bad part. That's the good part. But the thing that I find myself repenting of is the things of the false teachings I was taught as a minister. The false teachings I was taught as a regular pew member. The false teachings, doctrines, and teachings I was taught. And it, 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 it blows my mind that I come to church and find church, they, they, they decide they want to celebrate Easter instead of Passover. Mm -hmm. And every time we say Easter, we're denouncing and rejecting the birth, the burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus.
Because as we begin to understand the true meaning of what that word means and how that came to pass, we realize that it's a disrespect to God. We find ourselves celebrating all these different pagan holidays and as if they brought paganism into the church. And then we even find ourselves praying paganism prayers. We can't understand what the blood of Jesus means when we quote the blood of Jesus, when we say the blood of Jesus, or we even apply the blood of Jesus. We've got to know what the blood of Jesus means. To understand that, we must study Exodus 12. And you thought I was going to say that it's not biblical or something like that? <laughs> no, we, we study Exodus 12. See, because Exodus 12 tells us about the, about how, about the Passover lamb, about Moses, and what the purpose that that blood was. That blood was the thing that covered us from death. So if Jesus shed his blood and died for our sins, then we should be able to have some control over speaking to death and telling them to go and let that loved one go. But by not having the correct biblical teachings, a lot of people accept it and allow our loved ones to go without them being snatched. We allow them to go to death, embrace death, instead of saying, okay, how do I get to the throne to cause this, to reverse this situation? We allow babies to die because we don't know how to preach to the situation, speak to the situation, but yet we what we do. If God is so good, why? 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 Well, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, why aren't you interceding so that it won't happen? But we never question why we. We always question why God. You see, we must begin to understand that this is a warning right now. We must be quiet and listen to the voice of God. We've got to listen to the trumpet blow. Because God is calling us. God is saying some things to us. God is leading us. God is guiding us. Everyone's looking for a prophetic word, and you don't need a prophetic word. All you got to do is get into God's presence. And as you begin to get into God's presence, God will begin to speak to you. Yahshua will begin to speak to you. Elohim, Jehovah Jireh. Many attributes of his name, characteristics of his name. In the Hebrew, the Greek, or the they call him Yahshua, they call Jesus Yahshua HaMashiach, meaning Jesus Christ the Messiah, or better yet, the Savior anointing. And then, was it Jesus Christ, Savior anointing, Christ Jesus anointed Savior. So that's the reason why they say, in one scripture they say Jesus Christ, and in another scripture they say Christ Jesus. But in studying, we learn how to use his name in our prayer. Sometimes in our prayer, we got to go in Jesus' name. Sometimes in our prayer, we got to go in Jesus Christ's name. Sometimes in our prayer, we got to go in Christ Jesus. See, because it's different ways that you use his name causes different things to happen and the atmosphere to be shifting, things to turn around and things to occur. A workman needed not to be ashamed. What? A workman not be ashamed. What did he have to do? Rightly divide the word of truth. Now, he didn't say rightly divide the word of truth, did he? No. What did it say? Truth, right? Truth. How many of you know that truth and true are two different words? Yeah. Okay, yes, yeah. But how do you know, how many of you know that they are two different meanings? Mm -hmm. That which is true is not the truth. And that which is the truth is not true. I don't want to sound like one of those oxymorons or one of those things that kind of play with your brain and what came first, the chicken and the egg. Well, that is true is subject to change. T-R-U-E is subject to change. That's constantly ways to change that. It's because you're constantly adding and subtracting to it. It's constantly changing. But the truth never changes. The truth stays the same. Jesus is Lord. That's the truth. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, shed his blood. He was crucified on the blood, I mean on the cross. He became a curse for, them, for us. He took victory over, the, over death on the cross. He didn't go to hell. He didn't go to hell. He took victory because in the Bible it says that he made a public show of it on the cross. That's why if you look at the Passion of Christ, you see the devil freaking out and losing his mind because Jesus took victory on the cross the moment he said it was done. 
It was victory. It took place. Earthquakes took place. Things took place in the spiritual as well as in the natural. When Jesus hit the earth, he, oh, he, 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 he moved in the spiritual and the natural. As believers, that what we, that's what we do. We go in the spiritual as well as in the natural. When you're praying, you're not praying in the natural. You're praying in the spiritual. Although you see yourself and you hear yourself, but also there's a spiritual, natural thing taking place. That's why we always must pray before we pray. But you're saying we must always set the atmosphere before we pray, meaning that we must go into praise and worship before we pray. Our Father who art in heaven. There's a worship that goes forth before we go into the throne. And then as we begin to go there, then we begin to pray. And then as we begin to pray, we take our time. And as we take our time, God begins to show us things. God begins to flash things across our mind. You know, have you ever prayed and it seemed like you fell asleep and you were like, man, how long was I sleeping? In reality, it could have been that God took you someplace and brought you back and you, you found yourself like, wow, how long was I out? You ever had one of those strange prayers where you're praying and then you, you think you, you fell asleep and you woke up and you're like, but yet you, you find yourself still praying. You're like, wow, what was that? See, as we begin to get into God's presence, get into his presence, in his presence, we understand the purpose of being, the purpose of understanding what he's saying to us. See, because God don't just tell you something for you. He's telling you something for the people that's around you. Because if I step outside and I slap somebody, it don't just affect me and that person I slap. It affects the person that's attached to them because the person that's attached to them might come for me if they don't come for me. So did I really slap that person or did I just slap somebody that's going to come back and retaliate because of what I did to that person? So reality was, as we pray, as we do anything, it's not just what you see in the natural. There are other things that take place. Spiritual is only a mimic of a mirror of the things in the natural, and the, and the natural is mirrors things in the spiritual. So then when you see things occurring, you see death in the streets, you understand that there's death in the spiritual realm as well. There are so many people in church that I did. Mm. Rightly dividing the word of truth, so it tells us how to dissect the word. Because if I don't know how to dissect the word, I just take the word for what it is. A lot of people take word for face value. When they take the word for face value, what happens is they don't not only wind up poisoning themselves, they poison everyone that they false quote, false quote, they quote the scripture and make it sound like to blend in with what they want to make it blend in. And next you know, there's poison spewed out. And now you're quoting the scripture out of context. And now you're quoting the scripture out of context. And you're wondering why all hell breaking loose in your life. Because you called that scripture into place to be the way that it's supposed to be in your life. Yeah, that's why God said his word would not return to him void, but it would do that what you said it after because you quoted the scripture wrong. It's going to come back to you wrong. That just came to me too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of stuff that I, you know, like when I speak real fast, most of that stuff comes to me real quick. So that's why I talk real fast because I don't want to miss what I'm hearing. Okay. 16 says, but shun profane and vain babble. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. So it says, as I begin to study the word, as I begin to get into the word of God, as I begin to allow the word of God to move in my life, teach me, train me, develop me, as I allow the word to bring me into like what Romans uh, 12, and, uh, 12, and, what is it, 12 and 2 says, be not of this world, but be ye transformed, but be renewed by the renewing of your mind, and so forth and so on. But what it's saying is, as I begin to get into the word, the word begins to transform me, mentally, physically, and spiritually, and it began, God began to show us things. God began to give us enlightenment. In my studying, as I come to my close, I find myself studying and God takes me here, he takes me there. And the things that God showed me, he, I'm not the only one that he showed. So never let nobody say, well, God, uh, you know, God talked to me and only me and only. No, when God showed me stuff, he showed everybody. And then I find other people that I can talk to and it only like iron sharpens iron and it only causes what he's showing me to get bigger. So don't think it's strange if God reveals something to you. The thing is, you just need to connect to somebody that God revealed that to too so that it can, you can get a clearer and bigger picture of it. Because sometimes God reveals something to you and you're like, well, I don't know about that. That's the purpose of studying. See, because if I get a revelation without studying, I, it causes religion to develop. You see, and religion is the thing that put Jesus on the cross. So he says, in my studying, it will cause me to get away from all false doctrines, false teachings, and all these fables, and you know those little, you know those little, what do they call those old little sayings where you say if if you if, uh, if your hand itching, then somebody giving you money, or your eye itching, somebody want to visit you, and all that stuff. It yeah. says in your studying, it causes you to get away from that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it says the word studying the word will cause you to get away from it because they have scripted, they have 
stuff that's not even scriptural that people quote and even preachers preach, and it's not even in the Bible. It's not even in a, I don't even know where they got it from. You know, God won't put more on you than you can bear, or, uh, you know, it's God's will, or he's in a better place now, or, you know, God bless the child that got his own. That was a song. That wasn't scriptures. But in my studying and my researching, because I, I was studying for in, this, in another area, but then I happened to see something that brought my attention about sweeteners. And the guy was doing the thing on sweeten, was it, uh, Splendor. And he talked about how the stuff that's inside of Splendor was also, I think it's chloride or chlor something. Actually, it started off as a, as a um, uh, what, what did I say it was? It started off as a... Uh, Pesticide. It started off as a pesticide, and then one of the guys told the guy, uh, one of the teachers told the guy to test, to taste it, and he tasted it, it was sweet, so they wound up using it inside of the sweetener. Then they also got some stuff in there. I forget what it's called, but it's formaldehyde. And see, these things are the things. The formaldehyde is the thing when it gets to your brain, it causes the forgetfulness. Yeah. It causes dementia, Alzheimer's, speeds that up, and people that use that have diabetes it really mess them up. And then you got stuff that's in, uh, what is Sweet and Low, the pink package. Uh -huh. Sweet and Low, and then some other package. They got the red writing. But yet, why would we take stuff in, on the package that could cause cancer in lab mice? Why would we put that in our, in, our, in our food? Why would we put that in our coffee when knowing, it's like this. I know I don't supposed to drink coffee, but I do. Why? Because what happened is coffee, all it, all it does is it kicks sugar into your pancreas. But yet we put, we, but I have to have a lot of sugar in my, in my uh, uh, coffee. It's like with sin. It's like with sin. Although I know I don't supposed to do it, it's such an addictive point that if I don't do it, it's as if, it's like, you know, it's like certain things, we call them little, little sins. It's not such a thing as little sins. There's either sin or no sin. You know, it's like, well, if I just say this to her, it doesn't matter. It's just for me. But it's a gate open. You see, sin is called sin because sin opens up gates and gives Satan legal access and legal, legal uh, process to get into certain areas. That's why they say homosexuality is a sin because in homosexuality, there are certain things that take place in that transaction that causes things to occur in the body. There are certain things, that's why they say that uh, premarital, because the simple fact, because there's transference of spirits and transference of emotions and transference of things that occur to the point that you wonder why you see people look like, what do they call it, sprung and nose wide open, because the simple fact that the demonic spirits that took place, you gave a legal access to an illegal, you give a legal access to a legal, a legal situation. But we don't know that if we don't study. We just think that God, that everything's a sin. And everything's not a sin. Mm. It's just a simple fact that in your studying, you will understand that why God called it a sin, why God said no.